Hi, everyone. Welcome so much for tuning in to the 2021 PAL Summit. Uh, we are live streaming on HowlRound currently, and we welcome everyone who's joining us uh, this morning. Please feel free to engage in the chat, as I mentioned before. Um, for everyone who is uh, here in, in, in this space, in the meeting, um, you can turn on your cameras or you can turn off your cameras. We welcome all type of uh, connection uh, with us. My name is Adriana Gaviria, and I'm the D Director of Technology and Innovation for PAL. And I'm going to pass it on to Tamanya. Hello, I am Tamanya Garza, and I am the PAL National Director of Community and Justice Initiatives and the Philadelphia Chief Representative. Um, I'm going to be doing our land acknowledgement this morning. Um, I'm coming to you from the land of the Lene Lenape, whose historical territory includes the places colonially known as Delaware, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York, Long Island, and the Lower Hudson Valley. For more than 10,000 years, the Lenape people have been stewards of these lands, as well as the River of Human Beings or the Delaware River. Over the past 250 years, many of the Lenape people were forcibly removed from their ancestral lands and dispersed throughout the country, though some families remain. These families continue the traditions of their ancestors to this day. The violence that removed the Lenape from their homeland is a powerful part of the history of Pennsylvania. And we acknowledge that in this moment, and we work to live on, as we work and live on these very lands. This is the story of our entire country. We encourage you to learn about the lands where you live, work, and the history of the people who lived there before colonization, many who still live there today, though they are often starved of the very resources they protected for so long, including access to housing, sustainable food practices, safety, clean water, and the land where they once lived with their families. This information was provided in part by www.lenape-nation.org. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamanya and Adriana, for welcoming us into this space. Um, we receive and appreciate the land acknowledgement and acknowledge it ourselves. My name is Rachel Spencer Hewitt, and I'm the Director of Programming and Resources at PAL. And it's my absolute pleasure to be a part of this community that welcomes you to our third year of gathering. Um, I wanna say thank you to um, our partner organization, the Public Theater, for um, providing um, the sponsorship that makes this gathering possible. Um, and we'll be engaging with them um, culturally later on in the week as well. Um, I wanted to share some community agreements uh, that we all uh, formed together so that we all know we're entering this space as contributors, even when we're just receiving information. Um, and first off, I would like to offer that. As a session participant, you commit with us to welcome all caregiving responsibilities and realities in the background or foreground of any meetups, phone calls, and exchanges, and embrace your life in our pursuit of productive and supportive practices. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating a transgender and non-binary affirming space. All language that includes, but is not limited to mother, parent, dad, caregiver, et cetera, applies to any individual who identifies with the term and we welcome them. As a session participant, you commit with PAL to creating spaces rooted in justice and anti-racism in our structures, practices, policies, principles, and producing. As a session participant, you commit with us to creating safe and supportive spaces for disability access and inclusion and in all access needs present in the space. I would also like to offer that in our virtual world, we cannot always predict where harm can occur. If anyone on any of our sessions feels unsafe or feels vulnerable, if Zoom bombing or anything that is perceived as the outside is micro, but is not micro to you, we affirm your experience. And I want to encourage you that we prioritize safety over civility. Please feel free to stop the session at any time. You can also ask for support in the chat by private for um, anyone who you feel is an ally in the space. And we're happy to engage immediately. So that is my absolute pleasure to introduce um, the moderator of our space, Noelle Diane Johnson. And I would like to introduce Noelle's beautiful work to you so that uh, she can guide us in this conversation today. Noelle Diane Johnson is a multidisciplinary artist, stage manager, and artist advocate based in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. 
She is thrilled to be she is thrilled to be um, a part of this panel, and we are thrilled to have her. She is also the founder and owner of Artists Heal, a company designed to create healing and care spaces for collaborative art making, while centering and providing resources for marginalized folks and vulnerable communities. Noelle believes in servant leadership and offers programming to promote self liberated, inclusive, and equitable spaces designed for healing and expansion through artistic practice. Noelle was also a part of a production that you'll be hearing about more in this conversation. Um, and we uh, would love to pass the space over to you, Noelle, to guide us. Thank you so much. Hello, hello, everyone. Good morning, good morning. Thank you for the introduction, Rachel. I'm so, so thrilled to be here leading this conversation um, for uh, BIPOC leaders in this space. Um, and this conversation is with some of the most groundbreaking artists that have been responsible for not only creating shift and change in our industry, um, developing frameworks for sustainable solutions for parent artists, creating visibility uh, to the range of roles of caregivers inside and outside artistic spaces, and their work is committed to creating and supporting communities through action, service, and advocacy. This group of leaders continues to, to, to support develop and deepen their work based on a level of care building supportive structures that takes care of their communities, communities, their companies, and the people that they work with. So this morning, I'm really thrilled to be here with Lamish Miller-White, a panelist at PAL's first ever launch forum in Philadelphia to talk about her family inclusive supportive culture at Theater in the X, which she co-founded and is the executive director of. Um, and she also became the first ever chief rep for a local chapter and defined the role for POW. Um, hi, Lanish, welcome. Hello, hello, happy to be here. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm gonna go through introductions for everyone and then we're gonna jump into everyone's story. So next is Adriana Gav Gaviria. Please correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, awesome. <laughs> POW steering committee since its inception regarding reproductive and anti-discrimination rights and work-life balance and has been an advocate since before joining on, producer of the Latinx Theater Commons convening in Miami, where she is a partner with PAL to create caregiver family invited on-site international conversation spaces and became a member of PAL's advisory board due to her insight on the field. Now PAL's director of technology and innovation where she produces the PAL summit and other PAL national gatherings. Also here is Garlia Cornelia Jones, founder of Blackboard Plays since 2007, I believe, and has run this home for Black playwrights through, through her mother, her journey. To this day, she is also the first recipient of the PAL Mother Artist of Color Child Care Grant, now known as the BIPOC Mother Artist Child Care Grant. Um, she is the PAL Chief Rep in NYC and PAL National Director of Production, which oversees uh, the Black, Mother, the Black Motherhood Play Festival, Play Festival in partnership with Blackboard Plays. Um, and last but not least, we have Samanya Garza, who was the director of Barrymore award-winning Cry It Out, produced with Sympatico Theater Company, which had children in the space, family supportive work scheduling, diverse casting, and creative team stipends for childcare. Um, she is also, she also leads as both current PAL Chief Rep of Philadelphia for almost three years and PAL National Director of Community and Justice Initiatives, where she shapes and oversees the Centering of Justice and Caregiver Support Initiatives for PAL, national resources and programming, as well as, chief, as, well as the Chief Rep program around the country. Wow, what a group of people we have with us this morning. Welcome everyone, welcome. I'm really thrilled to be here with you all. We're gonna jump in. Lanish, hey Lanish. I've had the pleasure okay. of working with Lanish with Theater and the X. Um, and I was hoping that you could just share with us a little bit about the company that you co-founded and lead and <clears throat> your role as a parent and artist and how it's framed um, the work that the, co that the company continues to do. Sure. Um, so we created, we being myself and my other two co-founders, Walter DeShield and Carlo Campbell, we co-founded Theater X in 2013, essentially because we did not, we weren't seeing the opportunities for artists of color in Philadelphia theater. Um, 
usually, you know, folks of color, especially black artists were only getting work during black history month. Um, and so we wanted to provide opportunities for theater artists of color in the city, as well as we were kind of all feeling like the content of the shows that were being presented that show that told the stories of people of color during that time were all tragedy stories. It was all stories that were kind of filled with pain and tragedy. And we wanted to bring in stories that also, you know, showcase joy and kind of the breadth of the Black experience. So in 2013, we did a show, we chose to um, have Malcolm X Park as our venue um, so that we were able to provide the show for free for the community in West Philly, no ticket price, bringing down as many barriers as we could as far as location and like, ticketing and kind of and also comfortability in theater. Um, so just by way of that, we get audiences that are of all ages. Um, you can bring your baby, you can have, kids ride up on their bike and watch the show for 15 minutes and then ride away. Um, and so that was kind of the basis of why we created the company. So that was in 2013. Um, in 2014, I had a baby. And then, so we kind of took that year off as I was adjusting to parenthood and such. And so then when, the, when we came back for our next year in 2015, I had a baby and so now there was a baby in the space. Um, and that just kind of happened naturally. And then we started to kind of over time formalize our support of parent artists. So in the beginning, it was just like, your child is welcome. Sure, if you need to bring your child, bring your child and you know, someone else will hold them while you're doing your scene or, um, you know, or have them with you while you're doing your scene, whatever was necessary for that person. Um, and then we had me acknowledging my own like understanding that when I was in spaces that allowed children, sometimes I'm cool with having her, you know, with me on my hip. And sometimes I would like to like have her with me, but not have her with me when I'm trying to do the work. And so to kind of facilitate whatever that need was, then we started having um, one of our co-founders has older children. So they started watching the children while we were doing work. Um, and then we formalized it to our most recent year where there was a child care person, that person was on the call sheet, that person's like, you know, their conflicts were taken into account when we were doing rehearsal schedules, they were listed along with the stage management and the other cast and crew folks in the front of the program, like really formalizing that that the, the child care person is an essential part of the production, just like the stage managers. Um, and so being at kind of seeing our trajectory from we'll all hang out with your kids to there is a person who can now, you know, take them. She has snacks. She's, you know, even in getting because another thing is like we all know as as um, caregivers of people with children, like there are levels to caregiving. Also, there is a person to watch your child. And then there is like I leave her and I come back and she has like learned to dance while I was doing rehearsal. Um, so now we've gotten to the point where we have someone who is not only like watching the children, but engaging them, teaching them their own things while we are in the rehearsal process. Um, so I'm like really happy and proud that we have got to that portion of kind of where we are in handling um, caregiving and children in the space. Amazing. That's wonderful. So I hear you say about how you um, you had a child in 2014 and it suddenly became a necessity to create this holistic structure in this care space um, to support children. Can you talk about what that means to you as an artist and what it's allowed you to be able to um, pursue or what you've been able to kind of foster other artists to be able to pursue because of that holistic structure and care? Absolutely. I mean, I think it definitely, there are a hundred percent artists who have worked with Theater and the X who, if there wasn't childcare available, they wouldn't have been able to be a part of the process. Um, and so being able to, when it comes to creating access for artists of color within our company, like that is a barrier. So we're all, we're not only working on trying to take away the barriers for audience members, but also for artists. Um, and knowing that, especially for the artists of color in the city who aren't getting a ton of work on the mainstream stages, being able to give them opportunity to be in the show and not have participation in the show be an additional burden on them 
when it comes to either the drive for drop off and pick up for their children or the cost for childcare, um, or even just, especially if we go over this past year, even the comfortability of having them in some sort of childcare situation with COVID and things going on. So being able to provide kind of a, you know, your, your kid is two floors up and they're in a safe environment and you know where they are and you can now focus on what you're trying to do is like important for, um, for us kind of breaking that, breaking the barriers to people being able to participate with us. Um, and then for myself, I mean, any time that there is childcare available somewhere, whether it's an event or work opportunity or something, it makes it that much easier for me to be able to participate. Um, because then I know that I will have her taken care of, or she'll also have like, because we know how it is with like caregiver guilt, parent guilt. It's like, I also know I'm going to be doing something. And so if I'm, even if I'm going to see a show, knowing that she's going to be doing something that's going to be as engaging for her during that time, it helps me to be able to relax and enjoy whatever the experience is that I'm supposed to be enjoying. Awesome, wonderful. And one last question for you, Lanish. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement with PAL and what it means to you to be a part of this community? Yeah, I mean, our very first, the very first PAL forum that was in Philly that I was a part of was my first time seeing like completely set like child care within the same vicinity of where you are, like very formalized. It was my first time seeing formalized child care and I was like, oh, this is cool. And I remember like we all, those of us who were there, like we had children kind of all around the same age. So we had two people that had their potties with them that were doing potty training. Like just that ability to come and do work and be able to both like share space with other parents. I mean, that was just exciting to begin with. I think that's why I said yes in the very beginning. I was like, ooh, there are like other parents in Philly that do arts that I'll be able to like meet and network with. Um, and so having that environment and then over time, like just the connecting and learning people's stories like over, I guess was it the summer? Some, I can't, time is weird. But sometimes since the pandemic, when Zaz Powell's been doing the um, kind of like virtual uh, like afternoon meetups and hearing, even though I knew Tamanya before then and knew of her work, like the first time I heard her story of how the support and cried out came out, or the first time I heard Garlia's story about like her trajectory and parenthood and things. And it's just amazing to like see and be inspired and like hear the stories from other caregivers as like a reminder of like the possibilities and what we can do. Wonderful. Awesome. Thank you so much, Lanish. I want to lift up in the chat. The child care person is an essential part of the production, just like any other aspect of management. Lanish Miller-White, thanks for being with us. And folks in the audience, you'll have a chance to ask questions towards the end if you like. We're going to move on now to Garlia Cornelia Jones. Hi, Garlia. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm thrilled to share space with you and wonder if you could just share a little bit with us about Blackboard Plays, which you founded, and how its development has paralleled your motherhood journey. Oh, gosh. Um, so Blackboard is one of my first children, um, but preceding it, I also had a Black theater group in um, college. Um, and so all of the work that I do now um, just really is an expansion of the work that I did at Indiana U U University. Um, and so I'm, I think I'm, I am, I have gr grown to be very proud that I just really stuck with what I w wanted to do. Um, in in creating sp spaces for bl black artists and specific specifically black pl uh, play rights. Um, and when I founded Blackboard in two thousand and eight, um, we we were at a actually a mom run small theater and so we were incubated in in that space it's called the cell um and they 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 are in Ch Ch chelsea and so 
exposure to women and parents like started with just, you know, having the series in a space where there was a, a, a woman and then her daughter and then you know, I saw her her daughter have children, and the two, the two artistic dra- dra- directors both uh, b- both a par- parents, and so um, just re- just always like see see seeing that, and always thinking, how am I gonna figure this this out, right? And so then when I did have children in two thousand twelve, <laughs> my first child in two thousand twelve, and my second two thousand fourteen on the sidewalk very proud of my sidewalk birth I'm sure Rachel can drop the drop the uh link in the chat because I wrote the story in the New York Times so um you know giving birth and just having a child and then thinking how am I gonna you know continue this and myself having the dream that my daughter you know I was I was in the city at the a time and that I and I had a there was a small second room which had been my office which turned into her her room until we moved um and, but just like thinking okay my daughter's gonna sit in her high chair next to me while I write my, my uh, plays because I'm a pl- I'm a playwright um uh and so I thought that that was gonna be the journey but we all know that that doesn't happen because infants don't s- s- sit up straight <laughs> and they also don't uh you know stay in their high chairs and high chairs are expensive and you have to have the money to have them and all of those things so like all of all of that started to really you know impact me and I I really um think so much about all the things that come with being a a, a parent and a, a black a black parent because you start you have this baby and then you think okay I want to go to all the group gr- groups and all the things and those are so expensive and like exposure for your ch- your children if you don't have a high south salary or or if you don't have a, a two income household or if you don't have the resources to hire childcare is like, you know, is you have to do it on your own, but then you don't focus on your art. And so, and so how are you figuring out how to do both? You don't sleep, sleep, sleep right? So many people don't sleep. Um, and, and if you don't have a supportive book, a partner it just makes things more cha- challenging if you're tr- if you're trying to really devote yourself to your art and your par- par- parenthood so I think these are all things that um yeah sleep Lisa is such a, l- a luxury even now <laughs> to this day what is this day been up since 5 30 you know like here we are but but all of us right um and so I think uh just thinking about something I was really passionate about when the blackboard started or or as I as we went on in years was I wanted to build a retreat for parents and I I was slowly exposed to more parents in the theater and more Black parents and actually, no, I wasn't exposed to a lot of Black parents. That's that's not true. I was exposed to a lot of parents, but I didn't see a lot of Black moms in the theater or I saw I saw them in different places. And I think if now there are, are more because I think we were becoming parents around that um, uh, time. And just I was really thinking about how can parents have, you know, just like a retreat. How can how can parents have a space that um, that where they can work on their work, right? Because I'm thinking I'm going to write this play with my infant here, but is there a space where that is possible, where you have the sub the support either in resources um, to h- hire the um, care so that you can work on your play, or you're at a retreat the center that has child care built in this was also pre-space on rider 
farm. So just uplifting that they do have a um a play a a a residency for for parent playwrights and there's the sustainable arts foundation which does no longer includes playwrights but does include organizations and so I was able to get a grant um, at a residency in Detroit which included child care but since I'm from Detroit that was great because then my parents had my kids and I could work my kids and I could work on my play so I you know I I think a lot about uh, how we can give parents the resources in the arts to do, who do, do, who do, who do, do their, their work and, and part of that journey with Blackboard has always been thinking about, you know, how are we gonna make, make this space? And so the Black Motherhood and Parenting New Play Festival was really born out of that des- desire that I had had for years to just like, I was looking back at notes that were way before I met Rachel and thinking, oh my gosh, I did want to do this like retreat for Black parents. What the heck? Like, cool, you know? And so, um, and 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 so just being able to bring that into fruition um, through this a p- partnership, which makes so much sense, right? Because the support that PAL gives to parents in the arts is amazing. Yeah, and I love so, yeah. I love that you brought up that this was pre kind of artist residency designed. I think that we've seen um, a lot of different resources kind of pop up in the past you know decade or so um, to support BIPOC artists, global majority artists. Um, And I love that you were speaking about, you know, some of the socioeconomic barriers that come into play when you become a parent or caregiver or assume one of these roles. Mm -hmm. And I know that you were one of the first recipients of the PAL Mother Artist of Color, which is now known as the BIPOC Mother Artist Child Care Grant. Can you talk a little bit about receiving that grant and what it did for you as an artist? Oh my gosh. I mean, it was fantastic. It was just I had just gotten a divorce and I was, had just started my full-time job at the public as a line producer. And so I was like, how am I going to, what am I going to do with the kids? Like, what is the, you know, like I I was going to be having to come home with them and do the dinner thing and all of that. And so having that grant covered me for like two weeks of child care for my kids um you know which which was which was a really great start start and I was like I was so grateful to, to have those funds that were just like this is for the sitter right I mean it is in incredibly scary to finally enter the work space and feel like how am I gonna do my job show up but then what about my kids like you really want like I'm I'm no a lot a lot less of an employee because I have two children um but if if, if it's not like fully included in my, like, in my, in, in my, I guess my uh, pa- package, like how, how am I supposed to make that work? Like what sort of flexible acrobatic things do I need to do with my finances or my life? What tiny hole do I have to live in in order to do a job and take care of my kids, you know? And so I, probably will have not never stopped talking about how important that was as a as a first step and how much child care support and like child care grants is something I am so passionate about because 
you know, as 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 a show for facing human, how do we ma- ma- manage that when when we are part of um, a community of people who who are involved in the sh- show too? And then you think about what about parents in the uh, production team? What about you know the actors who have to be there every of day and so these ch- child care I think uh grant, grants are so helpful to us to just feel like we can have our children taken care of and then we can show up at our job either re- re- remote or or on site but we can show up knowing that a p- piece of us is being taken a care of um and so I love what you said too about um you know one of the things that I like to lift up and I think is so amazing is that when you start to realize that all of your support doesn't have to come from one place that it can come from multiple different places and that you were starting your job at the public but you were receiving the support elsewhere right you talk a little bit about Um, you know, you said it was a a really great stepping stone for you. Can you talk about um, your job at the public as a producer and how the work that you've done with Blackboard Plays, um, the work that you're doing with PAL, the advocacy work that you're doing for single mothers contributes to that work that that you do in that space? Big questions. Um, I mean, I think I bring all of myself to everything that I do. And so uh, my public family my public theater family has got to know my children very very fast (laughs) very quickly my kids were there um and so and 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 having a space to bring your kids is also important part of child care resource and sub support as Anisha's you know talked about like it's not it's it's not just um, resources, but it's also resources of space and people. And yeah, they can hang here and hear some uh, crayons, right? So um, I, you know, I'll say that that my children were just like a really huge p- p- part of that. And you know, I am. I mean, I, I guess I, I'm. I am first a member of the Black theater community. That is how I have identified for like 20 years. That is the the work that 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 that, that I create. And um, that is a really important thing in how I show up, becoming a parent looped in uh, parents to 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 that as 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 well. So it's been really great to connect with all parents at the public, like just to find a community of people um, of all r- r- races and ethnic backgrounds who are parents who are going through the same thing as I am. So that like opened up this. Oh, here's we're working parents in the theater who are figuring it out too and us being able to support each other and say no 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 like we need to have this or we you know like just really building a communion there so that that's been great to just me I really I um I've gotten to work with a lot a lot, a lot of artists and artists who are uh, parents I worked with Jessica Bla- Blank and Eric J- 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 Jensen on Cole Co- Oka, Oka, Oka country and they they have a child you know who's now like all, like a tween tween age right so you know but it was really great because their d- daughter and my ki- kids I think when we, when we worked on coal country most of the creatives had one child or two and so there's there's actually a photo which I think was posted on of a pal of like all of us and our kids it was so it was so it was like really cool and fun in a way to say oh my gosh I'm around people who like understand right like I don't you know like just being with people who get that 
your focus is sometimes pulled or you got to go deal with this or the sitter called because they can't find the remote. I don't know, you know, like (laughs) stuff, something. And so just really thinking about that. And I think in terms of the way that, you know, the rest of my black theater community and how I loop that in, I mean, I, I really try and, I mean, the, the public has always been supportive of black artists over the years I think we 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 know and see some of the really great and beloved artists their work has come out of the public and I hope that I am part of that you know journey and adding um to this history and um support and sharing of work by and for black artists so um those are some of the ways yeah thank you garlia thank you for all of your work at the public and with pal and sharing your sidewalk birth story i can't wait to read that well and just and to say that sidewalk birth was one i'm also part of a group called harlem nine which also like in thinking about a black a mom that I was able to kind of see in the theater, Sandra Daly Sharif. We we are we are we are um, part of this group. So there's six of us, but she's been a parent, and so just being able to see her as a mom, raise her daughters as a working artist was was also an inspiration. And I <coughs> excuse me, I gave. I gave birth one week after our OB award. So when we were at the, 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 the OBs, all of us were there and I was super duper pr- pregnant and we're on the stage and I was like, no, don't you. And I could feel him like moving. And I was like, uh-uh, we're not giving birth here. I was like, we're not giving birth at the, at the OB. So he decided to come out a week l- later at, at, you know, on the street, but uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was also tied to another organization, another arts. Black arts organization. Amazing. Thank you, Garlia. Yeah. And that's um that's striking me as well. Like the the importance of community with parent artists and the need to experience, like to to hear and see experience and hope and strength and other parent artists to feel that you can do it yourself as well. So thank you for sharing. We're gonna move on, y'all, to Adriana. Hi, Adriana. So thrilled to be here. With you, you've been with PAL since its inception in 2014, um, but have been navigating the space of reproductive rights, anti-discrimination rights, and work-life balance within your community and beyond for years now. So could you share some of your influences for your work nationally and internationally? I've heard you share about seeing this work being done internationally on maybe a little bit of a different level, and I would love to hear about how some of those influences have shown up in your work. Yes, definitely. I was so inspired a couple of years ago, uh, just reading about all all the initiatives and organizations that were really moving this conversation forward. Um, And that's around the time when I when I reached out to Rachel and and Rachel was also uh, doing that here um, with PAL. And that's that's how we connected. And uh, it's been really, really wonderful just seeing how much progression of that conversation has moved along um, the last couple of years. I'm also a, a, one of the founding members of the Soul Project, and I'm a steering committee a member for the Latinx uh, Theater Commons. Um, and the convening that uh, we did in, that I did in Miami as the as the lead producer was really exciting uh, because it was it one was of the first, one of the first times that we we had a day specifically for. Uh, not only uh, children, but also for any any dependents um, that the conveners wanted to bring in that day. I also brought my my family along, my 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 older uh, uh, relatives um, to the convening on that day um, because I find that sometimes your family doesn't really know what you do. At least in my in mine, they don't, don't understand. You know, we we spend so much time and also theater and advocacy is just a little foreign um, to them. So it was really great being able to share that and have those conversations um, 
while they were in the room. And so now when they, when they see me, you know, go and, and talk about it or do these things, um, it's just so, so much great for them to be able to um, just understand a little bit better the conversations that are being had here in the States. Um, yeah, so that's a little, that's a couple, um, that's a little bit of, of what, what happened um, during the convening in, in Miami. Um, and then I was also definitely inspired um, by the Encuentro, which was a, also another uh, gathering of Latinx, Latine theater makers um, that happened in LA. And for me, it was the first time that I saw theater companies, groups, artists who had raised both their families and also created art at the same time, which was mind blowing to me <laughs> that they had been able to accomplish that. Um, and and it was a, it was really a wonderful time because it was an opportunity for me not only to see that and to see how it, it can happen, um, but also a chance for me to be able to to learn from from everybody and to have conversations um, with everybody um, in that in that convening, um, which led me to to be really. Um, motivated uh, to come back uh, to New York and and see how I as an artist can create change or how I can create work or opportunities not not only for myself but for other people um, and that really definitely changed my trajectory um, because I started off as an actor um, and like I had mentioned to to you Noel before as an actor you know I was just used to auditioning and um, just waiting um, for roles, right, to be written <laughs> for me. Um, and, and just by, by, by really being surrounded um, by the community, by your community, by people who are not waiting around, who are making a difference, um, it just gave me an example of what I should do as an artist, uh, my responsibility as an artist, um, and what I can do that I didn't know was possible. Um, I also have been really lucky to have been um, a part of NALAC, which is the National Association of Latino Arts and Cultures. And I did their, their leadership uh, program and also their advocacy um, institute. Um, and that was also a very, very informative um, in, in how to go to DC and to advocate um, for things that you believe in. I never knew that was possible. <laughs> um, being a first generation, I, that's something that was really foreign to me and it was fascinating. And, and to have that opportunity to, to be able to um, have these mentors um, really guide you, right? And in, 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 in putting, putting up a presentation and, and finding out what, what moves you, you know, what's your guiding star, what you want to happen, and then going to DC and to advocate for that with your representatives. Um, it was, it was, it was amazing. Um, I, I, I didn't even know that that's what you could do. <laughs> um, so, so I, I feel like it's just been um, learning from each other, right? Learning, learning, um, learning on, you know, on, on the job. Um, there, there isn't a lot of, um, or there hasn't, there hadn't been for me, um, opportunities for me to, to really learn about producing or about advocacy work or, um, or even other areas. It was just, it was just something that I, that I didn't know. And, and I really am just so, um, grateful and appreciative of everyone that I've met along the way the last couple of years, because we all learn from each other, right? Um, and that's how you may not think that you're making a difference or that you're, you're, you're making a dent <laughs> into, into, into uh, making things better. Um, but every, every action counts. Um, I produced a soul project during the, uh, the soul fest, uh, which is a summer theater festival um, in New York during the summer, and even something as small as being flexible with the writers um, as far as their schedules, you know, uh, being, being um, 
like really, really having that conversation and, and, and saying, I, I want you to be part of the festival. Let's see how we can work around um, with your responsibilities as far as uh, family or caregiving. Um, it's little, little acts like that, that really, really make a huge difference. And, um, and I, I, I think I just want to highlight that because I think maybe sometimes you think you have to do these, um, I don't know, just everything counts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you so much. So you shared about some of your influences and you know how your trajectory really shifted and changed. Um, and you've also talked about you know achieving work-life balance and what that means as a caregiver when you assume that caregiver role. Can you talk about some of you know what you were seeing in the community, what some of the needs were, and then how you supported your community to, how do you support people to create work-life balance, especially as caregivers and people that assume that role? Um, and as has been mentioned in this conversation, you know, assuming the role of a caregiver and then realizing that it doesn't mean that you're suddenly not gonna be an artist, understanding that it's, you know, a matter of how to make this thing happen. Um, I'd love to hear about what what, what kind of, practical tools or action steps you help people with, with achieving that kind of work-life balance? Yeah, I, 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 um, you know, it's, when I look back, I, I, I'm a little incredulous of what happened the last, uh, year and a half, but also by the amount of, of work and change that was done also. And one of the things that just, just so happened to occur um, was um, a lot of change within, for example, the unions, right? And so Actors Equity um, at that time was, was looking and seeking for, for delegates around the country um, for their first, for first ever convention in its history. So it was huge. Um, and so during the pandemic, someone had reached out to me um, to see if I was interested. I didn't really know about it. I hadn't been engaged in that capacity before. And um, it just so happened that there was a large group of uh, BIPOC Actors Equity members who were really interested in being part of this convention um, and, and, and running um, as delegates to to create this change. And none of us had ever done any of this before. We didn't, we just kind of jumped in um, uh, and, and learned along the way. And as an actor, you know, you're either union or non-union as a performer, let's say as an artist, um, you definitely want your union to, to support you, right? In, in the trajectory of your career. Um, so those were the conversations um, that all the delegates that were nominated had, and there were in the in the convention um, there were many resolutions um, that that came up, um, and a lot of them were you know that were worked on for such a long time by so many people for several months, and we had such amazing resolutions passed. Um, so I'm only just bringing that up to say that. Um, that is just, that's one avenue, for example, especially, you know, here um, in, in the States where um, the unions have such a big role um, and there were things that were missing, right? We were missing that support. Um, and so it's, it was a very exciting time um, that this happened. So I just, so I wanted to just say that, that that's, um, that is huge. Um, another way, oh, I know we talked to this a, a little bit about it, just from a personal, just like a, from a personal aspect as an artist, um, how important it is to just say no, um, to give yourself permission to take breaks. Um, it's okay if you can't do everything that you want to do. Um, and that I, I am, a workaholic and I definitely have um, tried my best, um, you know, this last, these last couple months to, to have breaks, right? And, and to take time away and to say, no, 
I, um, this is family time. Um, and as, as we get older, uh, you know, our caregiving responsibilities expand. Um, you know, we are also uh, responsible often, uh, not, you know, not everyone uh, goes through this, but most people will be responsible for their parents or uh, their grandparents or their uncles or their aunts, any uh, elder member of their family, especially uh, if, if you are a newer generation in, in this country and there's a, a language barrier, um, you know, often one's, one ends up being the translator and also the one that has to figure everything out, all the, all the different things that, um, that seniors um, have to have to navigate and it's very difficult. Um, all the medical needs and all the retirement needs, um, which is something that I love to talk a lot about too, because in, in general, when we talk about caregiving, sometimes um, it's so easy, right? To focus on, on, the, on the parent-child uh, relationship, um, but there's so many other different types of caregiving needs. Um, and we sometimes don't realize it until we're there. So it's, it's really good to talk about these things um, so that you know, right? You know how to navigate those before you get to that point. Um, yeah. yeah, thank and you I, so much for, for sharing that. That really, um, when we spoke previously, that really, really touched me because I think that I, for a lot of folks that, you know, and this was a part of the conversation um, into to, well, we're going to head into Tamanya as well. But this idea of caregiving and, you know, that a lot of folks are doing the roles of caregiving, are assuming the, the labor of caregiving and don't necessarily realize that that's what they're doing. Um, so when it comes to work-life balance and preventing burnout and having boundaries and being able to say no and taking breaks, if you don't even realize that you're assuming this role, how do you even how do you even navigate or understand that when you're being exhausted by it? Um, and I really, really appreciate the um, the focus and the advocacy around caregiving that is outside of parenthood. Um, parenthood is a beautiful thing, but it's not necessarily something that everyone steps into. Um, but is no less, you know, a part of a, a part of a community of caregivers, or if you need that support, or you need that support as an artist, or you need that support in community um, to be welcomed into a community like PALS is really, really beautiful and really, really monumental. Um, so can you share just a little bit about what your leadership and caregiving advocacy means to you? and what you've learned on your journey. Because I know that your caregiving roles, the roles that you embrace as a caregiver and your journey has been um, a little bit different than the other panelists. Yeah, so um, I still, I think I still, something I have like this little reaction whenever, uh, you know, you, uh, I hear leader, right? Because it's, um, it's that hesitancy of, um, or that um, just not, not being used to um, having that, that name, uh, that title um, as, as someone who, and, and it was something that I, you know, I also wanted uh, to bring up is that, you know, anyone who's watching who may be shy or quieter, or, you know, just does, um, um, is, is not, is not used to being right in the public eye. Um, you, you may be a leader and you may not even know it <laughs> and to embrace that and to own it. Um, because, um, we are, we are all responsible, right. Of what we, what we do and how, what type of uh, spaces we create, um, or a part of, right? Um, and so I just uh, wanted to say that. Um, but for me, um, it's it's important. I I love. I just love. Um, I love connecting people, and I love um, providing spaces that encourage uh, growth. Um, and inspiration 
And for me, that's important uh, because I, I don't want people to experience some of the things that I have. You know, I think that, uh, I think a lot of us, um, at least from that I've spoken to feel that way, you know, we've all experienced something and, and it motivates us and it fires us up and it, and it, and it makes me angry. Uh, and I don't want other people to go through that um, painful experiences. Um, so that's why it's important for me to, to continue this work and to fight uh, because I, I, I have, I've seen not only, you know, I've just seen so many things happen to other people that, that I, um, I'm just, um, it just pisses me off. <laughs> I think that's why, I think that's why it's important for me to continue this work. Cause I just don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think that's something that we mentioned in our previous conversation too, of like, the pain point doesn't always have to be, you know, sometimes you have to get your heart broken. Sometimes you have to go through that pain and, and what it means to, you know, come out of the fire with, with buckets of water for, for the people to, to, you know, pour into, pour into your community and to allow that pain to have purpose, to allow the pain that you've been through and the situations that you've been through to drive you instead of, um, making you stagnant in the work that you're doing. So thank you so much for sharing. It's really wonderful. And last but not least, we have Tamanya Garza. Um, this panelist is extremely special to me. Tamanya, you've, you've changed my life. Tamanya Garza has absolutely changed my life and been one of the most phenomenal, biggest supporters that I've, that I've met in Philadelphia um, at a time where I was kind of stepping back into theater and trying to understand my role and coming out of some of the, you know, difficult things. So I'm really, really thrilled to be here with you, Tamanya. And I definitely want to jump into talking about Cry It Out. Um, Cry It Out was produced in 2019, in May, in spring of 2019. Um, and is this beautiful, beautiful story about motherhood and what it means to become a mother. Um, and just some of the challenges and um, real honest conversations. Working with you, Tamanya, on that show was one of the first times that I, and I think quite a few people in that process, had just had real honest conversations about parenthood and what it meant to be a parent. And it completely changed my view of motherhood and parenthood. So. I'd love to hear you talk about why that story was so important for you to tell. And also all that went into creating that space because it was a priority to have diverse casting. It was a priority to have family support. It was a priority to have stipends for um, childcare. We had childcare in rehearsal spaces and had that as a part of the, the calls and the work schedules. So I'd love to hear about what that process was like for you and, and um, you know, the pre-production as well as while we were in production. Um, and first of all, Noah, you two are extraordinary and you continue to change this community and make it more incredible and um, help us all heal, artists heal, help us all. Um, because like, like you're talking about, I think a lot of us, um, and in Philadelphia, we have so many different kinds of theaters. We have incredible theaters like Theater in the X, um, you know, and, and, and all of these incredible theaters that are working for inclusion and to make space for people of the global majority. But there are many theaters that still struggle with that and still struggle with giving voice to, um, you know, a, not something that doesn't fit within that very homogenous classics group that has been sort of selected out of the cis white men that have come before us. So I think that, um, you know, we, it, it was important to me, like some of these trailblazers and, and, you know, looking to people like Lanish and, and like Arliot who, and like Adriana who had come before me and just sort of say, I, you know, I have gone through these horrible things. I've gone through these traumas in theater that I love. And like, you know, I had said back, I had not directed for years before Cry It Out came along because I had experienced some, some real harm and I had seen people harmed in the spaces. And I was like, I can't believe in this place of empathy and creation, we can't find a way to be safe. Like, I cannot believe that that is, that is a thing and that we have to, that the price to be here is trauma. 
And so I, I had taken, like you, I had taken some time off and what got me back, um, I, I, I was pregnant and I found while I was pregnant that I was um, not talking about being pregnant. I was hiding it. I was not letting pictures being taken of me. I was not going to theater as much. And um, I didn't feel shame about the pregnancy, but I felt it would absolutely diminish my ability to, to get jobs because as a director, who's already a person of, you know, from a historic marginalized community, um, there are very few jobs that people think of me first or think of me as being the right fit or think of my personal experience because for some reason, white directors can direct everything. Mexican directors can direct Mexican plays about being Mexican with Mexican characters. So, and, and, and you know, I, I don't believe that to be true. So in trying, to, in trying to see a larger picture and in trying to create the experience, I wish I had had accessible to me um, while I was pregnant, I had taken time off. I was like, I'm not directing. I'm, I'm not going to do anything. Um, and I'm not even going to see shows. And my dear, dear, dear friend, Alison Heishman, who I went to college with, who was running Sympathico Theater and, and is running Sympathico Theater now, wanted to create just a very different space for artists to create in where the whole artist was considered. And she sent me this beautiful play by Molly Smith Metzler, who actually is now working on a Made for Netflix and another story about what it is to be a parent. Um, and, and she was like, oh, just read this for me. And this is how she tricked me into directing for her. She was like, just read this for me. And I was like, okay. So I'm sitting there with my breast pump and, you know, two in the morning on my phone, like reading it. And I was crying and I was laughing and I woke up the baby a couple of times. And I was just like, I was like, oh my God, this place is amazing. You have to do it. You have to do it right now. And she's like, no, you have to do it. And I was like, mm, no, I'm not. I have a baby. I'm nursing. Like it, it, it just, the world doesn't exist wherein I can be directing this and do my best work right now. Um, and she was like, so what would it take? And I was like, I don't, what do you mean? What would it take? She's like, make me a list, make me a crazy list of what it would take to make it happen. Um, and we had been, it was, it was, I'm talking about it, all these inspirations. We had been at that meeting, one of those meetings that Lanisha was talking about, the gathering in Philadelphia of parents. And um, I had just, Pal had sort of opened my eyes that there was someone advocating for parents to be in these spaces um, because parents, women, people of color, like they begin to drop out of the storytelling because it's just, you physically can't get there. Like Garlia was talking about, like Lanisha was talking about, if you can't bring your baby, you can't come. And, and so we just get silenced, just de facto silence because we don't have the support we need. And so, you know, she was, so I was in this room with Pal and Lanish was running it. And the person who would ultimately become one of the leads in the play was speaking, Angelica Jackson. And um, uh, the person who would eventually become the assistant director and dramaturg, Monica Flory was there. And so it, it, like Lanish was saying, I had never been in a room where being a parent was an asset and not, a, you know, not something that was going to make you lose jobs. And I just felt so energized and so incredible. And I was like, okay, well, maybe this is possible. Like, maybe I can do this. So I dream big. And I said, you know, I want, I want to be able to nurse and I want other people to be able to nurse. And I want whatever schedule we need for parents and people of color to be able to work on this. And I want, you know, childcare paid for in the room. And, you know, we applied for a grant um, through PAL and we got a grant that could support us for all of that because Sympatico is a small theater with a small budget, but um, every everything on that list was made possible with uh, cooperation from Pal and and Rachel and all the great people at Pal, but also because Sympatico always said yes. Like every every step of the way, Allison said, "Yep, however that needs to happen. Yep, whatever you need." Also, you were the expert. Like a lot of gatekeeping happens in theater because the people who are experiencing whatever they're experiencing aren't believed, or there isn't representation in leadership, and there was never a time where I came to her and said, I want this, it's going to be longer. It's, it's harder to cast parents. You have to make more accommodations for auditions and rehearsals. Um, you know, I want childcare in the audition room. So literally like we had people coming and people would sit with them in the lobby while they were inside auditioning um, so that they could come to the audition. Um, I wanted to make sure that the designers reflected the same diversity. I wanted to make sure that we were focusing on parents being in the room. So. Uh, all of that was made possible and, and it was made possible because it was intentional from the beginning and because the theater company and PAL decided from the beginning that the, they would support us in whatever way we needed. Um, and because of that, the group that was there, I think maybe wouldn't have ever had a chance to tell that story in a nine to five, six day a week, no childcare, no grants, no, you know, um, 
no nursing ability. No, like I think that those people literally would not have been in the storytelling. And Cry It Out was very popular that year. A lot of companies produced it. And almost every company who produced it had all white or mostly white casts. And we did not. And um, many of them didn't include parents and our cast did. And our production team included parents. And so, um, you know, I think, I think that's it. It was going in with intention and it was dreaming really wildly. And I always wonder if it wasn't Allison and we didn't have this like 23 year relationship that we have, would it have happened? You know, and I want to create, and I think this is what Pal and in general, everyone on this call probably wants to create a space where you, you don't have to count on that. You don't have to count on having a really trusting, you know, 23 year relationship with somebody. You can just walk into a room and say, I need childcare. Just walk into a room and use the power. I, I wanted to use my power as a director to carve out that space for everyone. So actors didn't have to have that fight. So technicians didn't have to have that fight. So people who were, you know, working just for the day didn't have to have that fight. Um, I'd already had it and it was, it was baked in, like it was part, part of the production. Um, and I, and I think the performances we got, I think, as you were saying, the exposure to kids in the room, seeing someone be a director and seeing someone be a parent are very different skills. And I think the people who weren't parents in the room, um, as much as the parents grew a lot and learned a lot, seeing everything we were carrying into the room with us every day literally our little ones into the room. We would sit around and have pizza together. I remember at one point um, there's there scenes where people curse and yell at each other and the babies were off in another room. And one of the babies was like banging on the door and like, don't say that to my mommy. <laughs> and, you know, even just that, that that's in the back of your head all the time. Um, so I think welcoming them into the space, especially for a play like Cried Out that is about the complexities of motherhood um, and parenthood. I don't think the production we had could have existed without the supportive situation that we were so lucky to be able to create that I hope one day isn't lucky, that I hope one day is just standard, standard, standard. Exactly. Yes, yes, amazing, amazing. And something that I really admire about the work that you do, Tamanya, is creating visibility. So similar to uh, Adriana, what Adriana was saying, just this visibility around caregiving um, and this idea that this is a thing. <laughs> this is a thing that everyone on this call is doing. This is not just this invisible emotional labor that just comes with what it is. Um, and we've spoken a lot about, you know, specifically, you know, for, for all being inclusive, but specifically for folks that are socialized female, how that imbalance kind of comes into play. Can you talk a little bit about, um, the importance of visibility and the importance of um, specifically offering, you know, support where those kind of disparities lie in caregiving spaces and caregiving roles. Um, absolutely, and I, I think that's a really excellent question, especially, um, you know, some of the things as Dana talked about and that were mentioned in the chat. Actually, I'm a member of the Sandwich Generation, so I have parents I was giving caregiving for and a parent with a disability at the same time as very young children and um what that the only thing I can tell people that feels like is having all of like the maximum amount of tabs open on a computer trying to do work and then someone pours a bucket of water to, on the computer like it's there's it seems impossible it seems overwhelming it seems like and it's just so many I have to get the medication I have to remember to, to make sure that it's safe. Like even my father who, um, who was at the time sort of newly disabled, he had, he had had a, um, a stroke. He, um, we had to make sure that when he came, there were flat surfaces he could work on, walk on and that he could sit very close to the door at each performance and, you know, things like that. Um, so just the, the mental gymnastics of doing all of that with caregiving, I have to do pickup. I have to make sure my baby has food for daycare. I have to make sure that the right clothes are washed that I've written. I, I just sent my little one to in-person school for the first time. And the amount of time I spent writing on things, writing their name on things, um, that's a job in itself. So just realizing that we're carrying so much and that in no way makes us less valuable as artists. If anything, it makes us more valuable. Like the multitasking that has gone into each of these people's work that is on this panel, I, 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 I like that. That blows my mind. That takes me back because running a company and or running multiple companies and a child and you know doing your work as a creative, um, it strengthens you. Being a parent strengthens you. It it shifts your focus. It 
I think it brings to you a clarity, but also an administrative, you know, an administrative whirlwind that has to be taken into account. And, and as you were saying, people who are socialized female, so often it, it's not even a choice of taking it. It's just a choice of like, oh, well, this is given to you. You're the oldest daughter. You're the, you know, you're the, you're the mom, you're the, you're the sister. And um, it, because of that, again, it drops our voices out of the creative space so often, because how can you create, as Garley is saying, when you have the baby that you thought would gently sit in the high chair and make cute faces at you, <laughs> um, chewing their hair or, you know, <laughs> like ripping their clothes off or going to the bathroom, like just the most basic things. Like I haven't finished a thought since my little one was born, not a whole thought. And that's okay. You know, that's, that's part of being a parent. But um, to get back to that creative space, you do need people who, who welcome that and who are like, this is a part of you. I'm mm -hmm. not going to compartmentalize you and take you apart. Um, I'm going to welcome all of you. Yeah. And I'm going to support all of you. And, and especially, as, you know, when you're doing all these different kinds of caregiving and some you chose, some you didn't, um, the, again, we're no less valid. We're no less valuable because we have that. And honestly, we are the backbone that is keeping the world going without all of this caregiving. Like who, who is taking care? Who is, you know, getting kids to school and who is making sure that so-and-so has their blood pressure medication. Um, so valuing that as a community, valuing that as a theater community that like, you know, you are fostering and and bringing up the next generation but also you are honoring the people who are who are older and elders and who made space for us like what an incredible what an incredible responsibility to be stewards of those two journeys you know and recognizing the empathy and the creation and the beauty that we would bring to our artistry because of it mm -hmm. yeah and needing to needing to really lift up it makes you and genuine i genuinely believe this that it makes you a more valuable artist. It makes you more valuable. You you can do more. <laughs> like you just there's there's a there's a need for it. And you know, when it comes to leadership and like facilitating spaces for leadership, a lot of times I will have folks think about, you know, don't think about managing at job. Don't think about your administrative job or your management job or your leadership job. Think about the, the places in your life where you're managing things. Are you managing your child's school lunches? Are you doing your laundry once a week and making sure that your clothes are folded down? Even if you are, you know, even if you're not necessarily a parent or a caregiver in that way, what are those ways that those skills are translating? Because that's where like the soft skills and things for leadership specifically within the theater industry and, and the work that we're doing as artists really comes into play. So I think that that's just such a beautiful thing and really want to lift that up, that it doesn't make you any less valid. And it, if anything, it makes you more valuable to this community and to the communities that you want to lift up. Um, and the last question I have for you, Tamanya, you are the National Director of Community and Justice Initiatives for PAL, so Nation. And I just want to hear a little bit about that role and, you know, what it is that you're, what's, what are some of the resources and the things that you're doing um, in that role? Um, and I will answer quickly because it's 1122 and I know we wanted to get to some questions. Um, but some, so I think what I really want to center in that role and when, when it was created, it was created fairly recently um, because PAL is a new organization, is um, just making sure that everyone in um everyone feels invited to these spaces everyone i think we I, I don't know if we talked about it on this call but i know in other calls i've talked um when i first had a little one it was like join this facebook group join this and so often um they are full of centering whiteness or uh you know making people of color feel othered or making us uh, you know, you can't show up as your whole self because if I show up with my hair in a bun and no bra and no t-shirt, it speaks to who I am as an individual and a representative of who my race is versus just, just a person. So not feeling my whole self in, a, in spaces like that, I never wanted anyone to experience that in PAL. And we're learning and growing all the time, but it's about access needs. It's about advocating to make sure we have ASL on all of our, uh, during, throughout the summit, which is something you know we worked on and made sure. It's making sure that um, we're centering voices from throughout the community, um, not just the voices who have risen to the top through you know this, this or that or the other, because 
um, because we we tend to boost up one kind of voice in theater historically, but also making sure that uh, we're we're asking questions and and we're looking at people in you know entirely with all these different things going on. If a person is you know has many different elements of their identity, can they bring all of them? Can they feel that all of them are being held? And um, we, you know we just want to make sure we do that with hard resources like slide decks that tell you about rights and things you can do to fight and advocate in your own life, but also with things like, uh, you know, panels like this, where we can make sure that we're hearing the voices of leaders who have been doing this work for so long. Um, women of color so often in this, in this industry are the ones who have been pioneering this work for so long. So lifting up those voices. Um, yeah, and then, and then just making sure we're providing hard resources and asking challenging questions so others can create spaces like that. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Lifting up some things in the chat. Or if you're not able to manage any of those things and you gave your kids a hug instead or took a nap. Amen. Holistic care. Holistic structure. Love it. Um, you are honoring the people, the elders who have made space for us. Tamanya Garza. Um, agree that I have found parenthood helps you delegate and empower others as a leader. Absolutely. Folks are, you know, needing to hear those words and hearing and feeling stronger and more hope from this panel today. So I'm really grateful to be here with you all. Um, we do have maybe about six minutes left. Um, I want to open the floor if anyone has a question or two, if we can drop a question or two, or if anyone has any kind of closing remarks. But otherwise, it's been really, really lovely to hear all of your stories. I'm really honored to share this space with you all um, and to be invited into this community to facilitate a conversation like this. Um, but please feel free to turn on your cameras and, and, and hop into the conversation if anyone is interested. I will say that I really relate to keeping, it a, keeping your motherhood a secret, right? Um, I, just, CBS. I just had a job interview uh, a, a phone call and I just, you know, I just had to put it out there. I just had to put it out there. I have, you know, I have a daughter who's disabled. She's 16. Uh, yes, I could, you know, maybe go into disability awareness or disability advocacy or something like that. But my passion lies in theater and it's the power of communication through theater. 